Welcome to the Women Leaders Association Daily Member Podcast, where we believe we go further, faster, and have more fun when we go together. I'm your host, Julianne Kirkland. And in each Daily Member Podcast, we will pick out a great speaker from one of our meetings that we thought you would enjoy. You can access hundreds of recent speakers, book summaries, great articles, and more at no additional charge through your membership portal. If you would like to get involved in a Women Leaders Association Mastermind Group or find a networking group near you, or if you just need access to the membership portal, simply go to womenleaderspodcast.com to be connected. Now let's tune in for this incredible message. Uh, Just to give, by way of introduction, I'm Bianca Ford. I'm currently the America's Head of Ethics and Compliance at Otis Elevator Company. For those unfamiliar with Otis, we are the first and the largest manufacturer of elevators, escalators, and moving walkways in the world. We operate in 200 countries and we move over 2 billion people per day. Um, But my favorite thing about my job is being able to participate in the company's mission of doing the right thing wherever and whenever we do business and supporting our colleagues in that mission as well. Um, Prior to joining Otis, I served as an assistant United States attorney here in DC, where I handled a variety of cases ranging from domestic violence and homicide to public corruption and civil rights cases. And before becoming a prosecutor, I was based in New York handling high stakes litigation on behalf of commercial clients. Um, I currently live in DC with my family, which now includes a five month old. And I am truly excited to be here today amongst this group of local professional career oriented women who have really carved out this time to support from, support and learn from one another. And um, fantastic hearing from the prior panelists and keynote speakers. Um, I really enjoyed hearing from you all. And I hope that all participants get something out of this session. Today, I want to talk about the high impact leader. And as I mentioned in my intro, I am an attorney. I've I've worked in a number of different spaces. And over the last 15 years, I've probably learned as much about leadership as I've learned about law and lawyering. I've learned as a result of being led by good leaders and not so good leaders. And I've learned from managing my own teams. But before I dive in, I'd really like to get a sense of who's in the room with me today. Um, Next slide, please. So if you could just um, indulge me here and uh, use the chat to kind of tell me uh, how senior you are in your in your industries and your positions, just tell me five years, two years, three years. I just kind of want to get a sense of, of our makeup today. 15, 4, 30. Wow. Okay. We have quite the range. Lots of senior folks, a couple of junior folks. I see some mid-levels. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So looking forward to the discussion. One other one other uh, reason to use the chat, if you could tell me, do you manage a team or um, are you an individual contributor? So if you if you manage a team, thank you, people leader, there we go. Feel free to write PL or IC um, to shorten it up. All right, lots of managers, lots of people leaders in the room. So you already know what I'm gonna tell you guys. I'll just sit right through it. Um, so I mentioned that I uh, have a five month old. I was recently promoted to mom. My son was born in November, and this past Monday was actually my first day back to work from maternity leave. So I'm just going to drop a little link in the chat so you can see my little guy here. Um, Feel free to take a look at it at your leisure. Um, But maternity leave gave me some time to reflect on my journey thus far, both professionally and personally, and to some degree to also plot next steps. And what my reflection confirmed is that I truly am in this stage of my life and career where everything I do just has to have impact, right? If it doesn't add value in some way, I'm simply just doing busy work that consumes my time, takes away from my self-care and takes me away from my family for no good reason at all. How many people can relate to that, right? If it doesn't add value, you might as well be at the spa or in on a beach. <laughs> That's how I feel about it. So I started to think about that word impact and what it means to me and how I measure it. And I came across an article preparing for today that is called How to Identify and Qualify High Impact Talent. And in it, someone named Cal Schilling basically defines high impact players as top 10% performers. They work hard and smart. They are self-motivated and focused. They achieve results. They can be competitive and collaborative. And I agree with that definition of high impact performance, but I believe that high impact leadership takes something more. So what I'd like to talk to you guys about today are the five behaviors that will elevate you from becoming, from being a high performer or high player to a high impact leader. And with that, we can move to the next slide where you will see Bianca's five 
high impact leadership commandments. Um, so these are these are um, what over the course of my career I found to be really valuable gems in in just making sure that. Um, I am performing at my highest level, especially now that I'm, I manage others. Um, so, you know, first, high impact leadership requires authentic engagement. I heard several of the panelists uh, and, and, and I believe our keynote speaker talk a little bit about authenticity. It couldn't be more important. You can't have impact if you're not willing to shed some of that baggage that gets in the way of us becoming our authentic selves. Um, next, we have high impact leaders. They need to identify and activate their superpowers. And if you haven't identified yours yet, I promise you have one. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. High impact leaders know the difference between effort and impact. Those two things are not the same. And it is really important to be able to recognize effort, but also model and create circumstances that allow for impact. High impact leaders bring all stakeholders along. And we're gonna talk about how to manage up, collaborate across, and how important it is to inspire down or below. And finally, high impact leaders challenge the status quo. It requires stepping out of our own comfort zone, um, pushing others out of theirs and breaking away from how things have always been done. And that can be uh, really difficult. And we'll talk about um, inevitable resistance when you are trying to challenge the status quo. Um, so, so let's jump in. Next slide, please. So authenticity is important in all spaces. I really do believe that it's difficult to be authentic at work if you're not um, able to be authentic in your personal life. But for our purposes today, I'd really like to focus on authenticity in the workplace. So what does authenticity um, at work mean to everyone here? Feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, make sure you guys are awake. What does it mean to be able to show up um, at work authentically? You know the real me, yep. I don't compartmentalize, hide who I am on the weekends, on Mondays, right? <laughs> Not having to code switch, love it. Yep, high energy. If you're high energy, you know, uh, intrinsically, you're high energy at work, love it. Always being yourself, willing to share who you are. Yep, exactly. So part of showing up, thank you all for participating. Um, part of showing up authentically at work is driven by the cultures of our workplaces, right? Um, have our employers and our leadership teams been diligent? Have we as leaders been diligent? about creating and maintaining a space that is inclusive and psychologically safe. But a large part of authenticity is also driven by our own thoughts and fears. So I'm sure you've all heard the term imposter syndrome, that um, icky phenomenon where we doubt ourselves, we, we doubt our talents, we have this internalized fear of being found out as not being qualified or being exposed as a fraud. And it's important to really understand how imposter syndrome can manifest. And it manifests in a number of different ways. For instance, when we withhold our ideas because we're afraid of how they'll be received, that is imposter syndrome. When we don't raise our hand and ask a question because we're afraid it might sound stupid or uninformed, that is imposter syndrome. When we avoid opportunities to network uh, because we're too nervous or self-conscious to engage with our peers and our managers and our colleagues, that is imposter syndrome at its finest. And I personally struggled with all of these things at the start of my career. I remember feeling as though my lived experience was very different from my peers. I feared not being accepted. And those feelings really did make me shrink. They gave me loads of self-doubt and stopped me from being the go-getter and in, in, uh, internal entrepreneur that I needed to be if I was going to be success, successful in a big law environment. Um, but after some time, that changed. First, I realized how much energy I was wasting being self-conscious and hiding. And there's a book by Carla Harris titled uh, Expect to Win. And in it, she says, bringing the real you to work allows you to be free. Putting on an act uses a valuable mental capacity that could instead be directed toward making important contributions. And I personally realized that I was wasting lots of time and energy trying to separate the real Bianca from the work Bianca. And the more I became comfortable in my skin, the more I was able to build meaningful relationships with my peers and with those who I reported to, et cetera. But I do wanna emphasize that there really is no magic pill for this. Part of the reason I was able to make that very important pivot uh, was because of the feedback that I was getting that was just not supporting, right? Not, a lot, not bolstering my imposter fears. For instance, the partners I, I worked with, they were coming back to me which if, you, if, if we have any lawyers on the call, you know how important that is, right? What that means when you have law, uh, partners in a big firm or any firm for that matter, you get an assignment and they come back to you with more. Um, I had partners recommending me to other partners 
And as a result, I was receiving awesome assignments. I was building relationships. I relocated to Dubai temporarily. So it was, it, it was a, that sort of feedback allowed me to overcome what was happening internally. It, it allowed me to get past what was happening internally and, and realize that that was false evidence appearing real, that imposter syndrome. So for my people leaders on the call, and there are many of you, what does that tell us? Well, I will say what it suggests is that feedback is not only paramount, it is empowering. So as leaders, we have to commit to giving constant and where possible instant feedback to our teams, right? Being able to get that feedback is what helped me realize, hey, I belong here. I, I can do this. I'm actually crushing this, right? And it's important to remember that when you're managing others, because the reality is, if we don't say anything, uh, psychology tells us that people assume the worst, right? Silence uh, causes folks to assume the worst. So we need to uh, combat that and hack that by providing feedback. And even if that feedback isn't positive, right? It, it gives our team, our direct reports, our peers, a chance to learn and improve. So for our individual contributors on the phone, if you're not in, in an environment where feedback is voluntarily offered to you, solicit it, right? There's no harm in asking someone after you turn something in or after a project, how did I do? What do you think? Is there anything I should do differently in the future? Because you don't wanna hear about that for the first time on during your performance evaluation, right? You wanna be able to address those things in real time. So, you know, my takeaway on authenticity is if you want to engage more authentically, first ask yourself, do I have any limiting beliefs that are holding me back that are affecting the way that I show up? And if I'm a people leader, am I creating a space for my people to be their true selves? Am I modeling authentic leadership? So being authentic is the first step. And the next, and one of my favorites is identifying your superpower. Next slide, please. According to Forbes, your supervisor, your superpower is that thing that you provide that's incredibly valuable. You don't have to remind yourself to be this thing. People count on you to engage your superpower when it's needed to save a situation. Personally, I would add that it's that thing that sets you apart. So, you know, early in my career, one thing um, that I noticed and it, it remains consistent is I've been able to take complex information and present it in a way that is easily digestible and generally engaging. Um, so this was true when I was a junior lawyer writing countless briefs. It was true as a trial lawyer standing up in, in DC uh, federal and state courts. Um, and it remains true to this day when I present to my team, when I present to, to our executive leadership team, and even today, right? Um, and I consider this to be a superpower of sorts. So I'd love to hear from those on the call if you're willing to, to drop your superpower into the chat. Um, if you're not sure what it is, say not sure. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how you go about identifying your superpower. But a couple of examples, a collaborator, Sandra, that's awesome, so important. I have two and I will never tell, fair enough. <laughs> Team building, yep, Natalia consistency, I see that, that's excellent. Wonderful, wonderful. So others, you know, if you haven't identified yours, if these sound um, as though they apply, adopt them, hone them, right? Um, Forbes suggests idea productivity. Perhaps you're that person that always has the next out of the box creative idea. Deborah, yes, getting folks to work together. Catherine, seeing the missing piece, pulling things together with it. Absolutely. Um, a couple of other examples, execution, flawlessly pulling off difficult projects, right? Linda, no fear, I love that, yes. Um, uh, presenting, right? Keeping folks engaged. Empathy. Maybe you're that person that folks call in to deal with difficult situations or people. Maybe you're the visionary. You come up with, with the, the, the grand scheme of how, you know, to, to run a program or to fix a problem. Um, or maybe you have significant persuasive skills and you're called in to sell the board <laughs> on, on something that's going to be really expensive, right? Um, so these are superpowers. And, and if you have them, and you do, you just need to identify them and own them um, and put them to use. So for those who are still trying to identify their superpowers, I encourage you to give some serious thought to your strengths and ask yourself, what unique contribution do I bring to the projects and conversations and meetings that I attend? What do people rely on me for? What skills do I receive the most compliments on? That's a big one, right? Like if you start to notice consistency in what you're being complimented on, that's 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 a message to you that this is something I'm really great at. Maybe it's effortless for you. It could be your superpower. Um, and then lastly, what would my organization or any 
organization that I'm affiliated with miss if I were to leave, right? What does my value add that is specific and unique to me? So those are really important questions to ask yourselves. Um, and then once you identify your superpower, you want to hone it and you want to find ways to employ it regularly. Okay. I heard someone earlier say, I think it was the um, emotional intelligence coach who, who basically said a part of you dies a little bit if you're not doing what you love, even on a daily basis. And I believe that's true. So when you find your superpower, um, use it, right? Because it's probably something you really enjoy doing. Um, and the more you use it, the more people recognize how gifted you are in that space, the more you'll be called upon to use it. I see a question. I'll just take it now. How have you learned to help those coworkers that have not found their superpower or confidence when your own coworker makes our meetings longer? Um, so I think that um, first developing that those relationships with the people that you work with, with your teams um, is important, right? Because you want to build a relationship of trust and you don't want to just have those, you don't want to try building trust when it's time to have a difficult conversation. You want to make sure that that trust is there. And that's built over time. It's built in the way you speak with people, the way you treat people. Um, so, you know, if you have that relationship of trust, people are able to sort of take take what, you, what you're saying and understand that it's coming from a place of care and a place of respect. Um, so I'd encourage you, if this isn't someone that you have a relationship with it, as yet, try to build that relationship um, or maybe, yeah, try to build that relationship and see if you could give them some feedback in that regard. So leadership commandment number three, differentiate effort from impact. I think the best way to think about effort versus impact is through a gym analogy. So sure, it takes lots of effort to wake up and go to that class in the morning. Any solid core people on the line, that is my jam. I love solid core, most effective thing I've ever done. If you haven't done it, free press for solid core. It's fantastic. Um, but if your body metrics aren't changing and your health profile isn't improving and you're going to the gym every single day or every other day, the impact or the value of those strenuous workouts is pretty much obsolete, right? Um, the same same is true about the effort that we put in at work. So to personalize it a bit, I was promoted into my current role at Otis in September of 2021. Um, at the time, I had a well-defined vision of what I wanted to do with our America's Ethics and Compliance Program. I set goals based on data. I worked with my team to execute initiatives that were designed to achieve results. And we wanted our efforts to have impact. And the first year was really dedicated to data-based execution, um, really thinking about how are we going to measure impact along the way at the right time. And the year that followed, which we're in right now, is really just focused on measuring the impact of, of our efforts. Um, you know, one thing that we noticed early on was, was who was primarily impacted by terminations, what, what level of tenure. So the question was raised, what are we doing to onboard our employees to make sure that they come in understanding our culture, understanding our deep commitment to integrity every step of the way? Um, how are we making sure that they're prepared? Um, so, you know, when you are measuring the impact of what you're doing, you have to turn to the data and you can't be afraid of the data, right? You have to be able to trust the data, um, be prepared for what it shows and adjust accordingly if the data suggests that you need to, to adjust. Um, so remember to differentiate effort from impact. As leaders, it's important to understand that we are either adding value or we're spinning our wheels without reaching a target. So we really have to abandon the check the box mentality. And in compliance, that's such a real thing because in a lot of ways, we have a blueprint from regulators of how to do X, Y, Z, um, how to make sure our program is effective. And there are lots of ways that people could you know, be misguided and just check the box. But if it's not working appropriately, um, if it's not doing what it's intended to do, you'll get dinged, right? And it's the same thing. Like as leaders, we cannot uh, move forward with the check the box mentality. We have to be constantly evaluating whether our efforts are having impact. So just re remember that efforts are simply actions targeted to drive results and high impact leaders focus on measure and report out on the impact of those efforts. Leadership commandments number four, bring all stakeholders along. So one of my catchphrases at Otis actually is that ethics belongs to all of us. And I say that because it's intended to communicate that every colleague and every function has a role to play to make sure that as a company, we're operating at our highest level um, with integrity at all times, every place we do business and every community that we move. And high impact leadership, I believe, cannot happen in a silo. It doesn't matter where you are in an organization. Whenever you're preparing to implement a new idea, you should really be thinking about who your stakeholders are. And I use that term very broadly because stakeholders can be internal. And in fact, they are internal and external. 
So for any given project, your stakeholders can include your customers, your patients, your end users, right, as external parties. Um, they include those who we report to, those above us in our reporting chain that we, we manage up. Um, they include those outside of our reporting chain, right, and other functions whose knowledge we can leverage when we're trying to achieve certain goals. And that's collaboration, right? That's somebody, somebody mentioned that was their superpower. Um, and, and stakeholders also include those who report to us, those below us in our reporting chain, who we are tasked with inspiring. So, you know, one of my biggest challenges in my role was reaching our, our technician population. Those are our folks on the front lines. They interact with our, our customers primarily um, and on a daily basis, and they're charged with installing and maintaining our equipment. Um, so I needed to increase engagement with this population when I started my, my new position. And I recognized there was no way that I was going to be able to do that alone, right? And so much, so many of the goals that we want to achieve in our workspaces, they, they rely on us collaborating and bringing others along. And we have to keep that in mind because really the only reason to go at it alone is to get all the credit. And the reality is, um, as an African proverb says, um, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Um, so in my case, I was able to, for one, bring my bosses in, right? Because I could lean on them and count on them to support me once I created and executed my vision of the solution. As I mentioned earlier, I needed to leverage others, right? Those who had a more direct line of contact with our technician population, for instance, our safety team and our branch managers. And I needed them to understand how my goals and their goals were aligned. Um, I, I needed to inspire my team. I needed to help them understand how their efforts were going to help us move this very important needle. And because of that, we've been able to do some really cool things, including um, partnering with the union that represents uh, elevator mechanics in the U.S. and in Canada in 2022, and a lot more um, to come in that regard. So it's just really important to recognize that leaning on others, asking others for help, asking them to contribute to your cause, asking them to bring their knowledge into a round table to help you execute a goal, that's not a sign of weakness. The reality is our corporations, if you work in a corporation, any sort of business that you're in, any sort of office that you're in, it's best when the right hand and the left hand know what each other are doing, right? Um, when folks operate in silos, that's when mistakes happen. That's when there are misses. So keep that in mind, that how important collaboration is up, down, to the side, and externally. And finally, leadership commandment number five, challenge the status quo. Um, challenging the status quo is an, it's an essential part of high impact leadership. When challenging the way that things have been done, you have to recognize that resistance is going to be inevitable. So you have to be prepared to deal with the resistance. And three ways that I found um, to prepare myself to deal with resistance is leveraging sponsors. So earlier I mentioned bringing my bosses in, right, when I needed to come up with a solution to a problem to, to, to give them a preview so that I could count on their support. It's a form of lobbying, right? Um, so you want to count on those people, identify those folks with political capital in your organization who support your work and call on them first when you have an idea that, that you know might face resistance, right? You want to engage relevant stakeholders. This is a little narrower than, than my last point, right? Um, you don't have to engage everyone. You want to keep, you, you might want to keep this circle a little bit more limited to the folks who have a direct, who are directly impacted by whatever it is that you are proposing. And you recognize that there's really no better way to amass significant support for your ideas and initiatives than making people feel as though they're a part of the process. Um, so again, silos just don't work. They're isolating and they are, um, they're off-putting. And then finally, number three, have data at the ready. When you are pushing the envelope, be prepared for pushback and having data to support your position is really the best way to show the opposition that they're focused on the past and rather than future and potential. So data is so important. And for those of you wondering, why is there this random criminal legal system book on the right side? I've shared that because um, that is my book, which represents one of the most meaningful ways in which I've challenged the status quo. After five and a half years as a prosecutor, I had ideas about how prosecutorial power could be used to inject equity into the criminal legal system. Um, and the principles and ideas in the book really do challenge the status quo and force readers to recognize that our nation, the way that it's set up to handle criminal legal matters, is neither the best way or the only way to do things. Um, and right now my book is being used in classrooms and in offices and in book clubs and really changing the way that prosecutors view their roles and the way that society keeps prosecutors accountable. So it's intended to be disruptive and high impact leaders disrupt. 
They don't disrupt for the sake of being disruptive, but they disrupt because the data suggests that disruption is needed. So I encourage you to take calculated risks based on the numbers and the statistics. As my husband likes to say, men lie, women lie, numbers don't lie. So you can't be afraid to try things as a high impact leader. To the contrary, it is our mandate as high impact leaders to challenge the status quo. Hey, my friend, if you enjoyed listening to this podcast, be sure to rate, review, and share your biggest takeaway. And if you're wanting more, you can access hundreds of recent speakers, book summaries, great articles, and more at no additional charge through your membership portal. You can also get involved in a Women Leaders Association Mastermind group or networking group near you. Or if you just need to access your membership portal, simply go to womenleaderspodcast.com to be connected. Because here at Women Leaders Association, we believe we go further, faster, and have more fun when we go together. That's all for today, my friends. Bye for now.